the reading of God's holy law. And now we, we turn to the gospel according to Luke chapter 22. We'll be reading verses 14 through 23 in our exposition of Luke. This is um, the gospel that we have been going through um, passage by passage. And we arrive today um, in verse 14 of chapter 22, which is the observation of the Passover meal. And in a, in a providential way, it falls the very Lord's Day that we are um, hoping to partake of the Lord's Supper so that we did not have to choose another passage from our exposition, but continue in the very portion of Luke that we have arrived. So Luke 22, verse 14. And when the hour was come, he, the Lord Jesus, sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not eat, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup, after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing thus far in the reading. Dear congregation, as we arrive in this passage, we, we find something regarding the Lord Jesus that His being human helps us understand that there were many things He experienced that were very much like what you and I experience. Uh, we, we come today to this solemn place, to this sanctuary. We, we join together to worship the Lord. And all of us have a complexity of things that have just happened this week. Work-related, family-related, travel-related, perhaps sickness-related. We have been hearing the news and there's a lot of commotion around the whole world. Some things affecting us now here and, and our minds are full of these elements and situations. And then we know we need to come to church and, and our minds are focused upon the Lord's Supper. We're, we're wanting this to be a moment of, of, of a sanctuary of sorts where, where our minds can be focused upon the things that matter most. And yet, while you and I have this experience that, that we wonder, how can we ever do this? You, you look at the Lord Jesus, even in the context that we, we are in, and we see that, of course, in, in His experience, it's just exponentially more, even eternally more. We, we have been following this last week of the Lord Jesus, and you remember how it began with that triumphal entry. But as soon as He does enter and His mind was of course, um, with a certain element of, of being blessed and with gratitude that there are people praising. But the first thing he does is he contemplates Jerusalem and he knows what will happen to that city because of the great sin that they are about to commit on the end of the week. He weeps because of their coming destruction. And then the following day he goes to the temple and he um, cleanses the temple. That's 
The, the second time that is recorded in the beginning of his ministry, he does this. And now at the end of his ministry, and you can imagine how tense this is and how many are now so angry and ferocious against him. The Lord Jesus dared to touch their, their financial system and, and, and accused them of something so horrible that they were like thieves inside the very temple. So you can imagine the commotion and, and the feelings of the Lord Jesus. And, and he taught during that week um, a, the truth about the resurrection. He, he answered those questions that were all there trying to, to catch him, to trick him. It's always pleasant to answer questions from people who you know are genuinely interested, but people whom you know are trying to trick you. It's, it's very hard to maintain your, your pose, to maintain your, your, your composure, because you, you just know they're, they're, they're trying to find a word to accuse you. That's what they were doing to Jesus during those last few days. And perhaps the most exhaustive teaching of Christ before this, this last meal that Jesus is now in this, in this room in a more quiet way. Um, the, the greatest part of his teaching was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. It was putting together why he was weeping for them. And then making it very clear, this, this will be destroyed. Not, not one stone will be left upon another in this temple. That's a, a lot of devastation. And then he also spoke of his very second coming and the end of all things. Not just Jerusalem, but of this whole world as we know it. The heavens and earth. It, it, before he left this world, he gave a very clear teaching about his second coming into this world. And then just last Lord's Day, we saw that the betrayer, Judas, one of his apostles, goes to betray him. Jesus is very aware of this now. And then he finds this place. He secures it to be a very peaceful place so that the Lord's Supper can take place. And we begin by looking the desire of the Lord Jesus. I'm, I'm really focusing on, on this reality of everything that could be going through his mind. And yet he is able and he is willing to have a moment of peace and quiet in that upper room with his disciples. And, and this is where we see your, your and my experience with Christ are very similar. Well, one of the reasons we're singing um, and throughout this whole service we'll be singing Psalter 47, which is based on Psalm 22, which is in essence the Lord Jesus' heart and mind all throughout the crucifixion and his death, <clears throat> his prayers, what was going through his mind and what he was probably praying in silent but the psalm starts with what he prayed openly, where we all heard. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And, and so Psalm 22 shows that the mind of Christ was, was full of things, full of thoughts. And your mind and mine are, are full of thoughts. There are many things, I'm sure, that, that, are, that are fighting for your attention and for your focus. And the Lord Jesus knows what that's like. And let us, let us then, um, in, in focusing upon what was in the mind of Christ, may that be a great help to, to, to keep away from our minds the things that are trying to compete with, with what to think and, and what, what might be more important. Well, there's nothing more important than learning who Christ is and then coming around the table for the right reason. Understanding the design that the Lord's Supper is, what Jesus designed the Lord's Supper to be. So these are our two points, the desire of the Lord Jesus and then the design of the Lord's Supper. What was the desire of the Lord Jesus? And I, and I give this word desire because we read in verse 15, And he said unto them, With desire... I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. The, the reason the King James says with desire, I have desired, because this is how it is in the Greek. It is just repeating that word twice. And when in Greek, and this comes from the Hebrew way of speaking also. When, when you do that, you were emphasizing 
that this was a very great desire. And some translations will go ahead and interpret that and say, eagerly I have desired to eat this Passover. Or it could be said very earnestly, with, with a very eager desire, I have yearned to partake with you. And, and let's talk about this eagerness in itself um, and, and start appreciating this. The Lord Jesus was aware of his coming suffering. He was aware that the very next day, this supper would be fulfilled. What this supper pointed to, which was the lamb who would give his life for sinners, it was tomorrow that it would be fulfilled. He, he was aware that that would be the fulfillment of the very first promise of a Savior. Remember when, when Adam and Eve had sinned and that first promise <clears throat> that, that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, but that his heel would be crushed. Jesus knows it's tomorrow. Tomorrow my heel will be crushed. Heels will be crushed. The, the beginning of the intensity of my suffering will be in a few hours. <clears throat> he was aware that, that he would be the Lamb of God who would be offered <clears throat> once and for all. The, it would be the offering to end all other offerings. The sacrifice to end all sacrifices. The atonement that would end all atonements. He would be the priest Offering the lamb so that no other priest would have to offer any other lamb, goat or oxen or pigeons or turtle doves. No more sacrifices would be necessary. And Jesus knew it was all, it was all um, because of his. If, if his sacrifice did not happen, all of those would have to continue and, and they would end up having no, no, no meaning at all. They, they had to culminate on His. And He knows that that is coming. And, and this is what's hel what helps us appreciate <clears throat> what Jesus is doing. He says, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. See, He, he knows He will suffer and yet He has this great desire. And, and as we appreciate that the mind of Christ was full and yet he wanted to partake of this Lord's Supper, it helps us realize how, how truly it is worthy for us to do all that we can to put everything aside so that our minds would be thinking of Christ. And this is what he did. He put everything aside so that he was thinking of what his ministry was all about. And, and we, we, we think this, this was the great love of Jesus. We, we could ask, well, <clears throat> what, what else was in the, the mind of Christ? Well, it was the great love he had for his own. Because that's the only thing that can explain that great desire. Why did he say, with great desire, with desire I have desired, eagerly I have desired? Well, because he loves them. Because... He knows he's doing this to love them. This, this was so much what was foremost in John's mind when he was writing the gospel that he said this in John 13, 1. He says, now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. See, John, who is the disciple of love and said much about love, he, he emphasized that. Jesus was full of love for his disciples. And this now increases in our hearts the, 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 the thought of what, what Christ was doing. He was full of that desire because of us. He was thinking of his own. He was thinking that he would die for his own and he would have his own for himself. And, and we put here um, something else that John says. You know, you'll, you'll remember how in, in John 17, also in, in that whole moment in the upper room, Jesus ends with that high priestly prayer. And in that prayer, he says several times and he refers to his people as the ones whom God gave to him. He keeps saying, them whom thou hast given me. They were thine, but then you gave them to me. 
And, and, and you start realizing why this loves. Jesus is seeing his church as his own. We, we are his gift, a gift from God. And, and because he loves the Father, he loves the gift that the Father gave. And he's willing to go to the cross to receive you and to have you as his own. It's his great love. Even he knows what will happen and he's willing for it to happen. He's willing to be betrayed, to be denied, to be cruelly beaten, to be mocked at the cross and before, to be crucified. He is willing to give his love, his life for his friends because he loves us. So, so this is what we can speak of his desire. It was an eager desire. It was the great love of Jesus. It was also, we could say, the near expectation of Jesus. This is something else we can say about the desires of Jesus. Because look at verse 16. For I say unto you, so this is so connected, I, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof. And before we go to the rest of the phrase, just think of that. I will not any more eat thereof. There, there was something that would happen pretty soon. And it was, it was simply this. This would be the last Passover period. This was something very peculiar about this Passover. It was very inevitable about this. It was very unique. It would be the last one. There would be no need for any new Passover meals. This would be the last one on earth. It would be the last one of Jesus, for Jesus on earth. And it would be the last one that we would have to observe in the way that it had been observed. After this, Jesus would leave. And, 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 and what was happening is that in, in ending it, it was introducing, that, that was like the introduction of the apex of the ministry of Christ. See, this is how you need to think of it. This apex, yes, would involve all that suffering that we speak of. But see, Jesus knew, this is why I came. And, and you can identify to some degree with this. If you, if you have a goal in mind and there is a desire for a conquest, there will be suffering and affliction, but your mind is so intent in that, in that, in that fulfillment, that goal, that you're really ready to go through the suffering. And, and it brings to mind a lot of what we're seeing when we see the, 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 the brave heart of men who stay behind and people who want to go back into a nation because they say, I want to defend that nation from the invasion. And you think of our own history and how there was a need for independence and there were those going to war for an independence. See, that was the goal in mind. It was a grand goal. It was seen as something good and desirable, but there will be suffering in the way. And that suffering doesn't deter you from going into the fray. And, and this, is, this is what's happening. Jesus knows there will be the fulfillment of the betrayal, the nails and the blood. All of that is true. But, but that is how he will have you for his own. That is how your sins will be forgiven. That is how he can have the gift that the Father gave him unto himself. And he can take us to heaven. So he's willing for it to happen. There's this near expectation. It is, it is so close for the apex of my ministry. And that was a desire in his heart. And then connected to this, we could say also that there's a farther anticipation that he's looking forward to as well. Not just this near expectation, but there's a farther one too. Why do I say this? Because he says, he says this first phrase, I will not any more eat thereof. Then he says, until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That phrase is not about the cross right now and, and, and precisely just a few days ahead, it really brings to mind something more in the future, even in the future for us. 
Because he says, and then he repeats this, he says in verse 18, when he gives that first cup of wine, he says, For I say unto you, verse 18, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. This, this shows that part of what was in the mind of Christ is the fulfillment of everything. Not just the fulfillment of that Passover, but what his death would mean. And once he goes to heaven and waits for us, and when he comes back and all of us join him, and that's when he will then drink with us in full communion where we see him face to face, where every single one of the elect are gathered together. That's, that's the sense of to be fulfilled in the kingdom of God or until the kingdom of God shall come. See, there is a coming of the kingdom right now, but it's not fulfilled. There's still more people to be saved. We still have to see the king come, and we have to be gathered with him in the new heavens and new earth. And so this is what's also in Christ's mind. And, 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 it, and it has to do also with this, there's this joy that, yes, going to the cross will be hard, but that's how I will have my own saved. And then he's looking far beyond that, and that's how I'll have my whole church gather together, the whole body of Christ, the, the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. But all of this, I, I can speak of this love of the Lord Jesus, this near expectation, the farther anticipation, but we need to also understand the heart of Christ was full of sorrow. See, the mind of Christ was not compartmentalizing all these things. The mind of Christ was full of all these things. I can't say that he was full of this love and full of this expectation, so now Jesus was all about joy. It's not true. And, and notice how true this is. The Lord Jesus, in the text, we, we, we read last Lord's Day that Judas goes and, and, and makes those, those leaders of the church happy because he said that he will um, betray Jesus and hand them over at a time that is opportune for them. Jesus knows that that has happened. And if you go to the very words of the institution, notice, notice the abruptness of this. When Jesus is handing the cup in verse 20, he says, this cup is a New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Even, even every time I preach this, I'm, I'm shocked by this reality. In your mind, you would think, well, given the, certain, the importance of the Lord's Supper, the solemnity of it, Maybe there's a couple verses there describing more about this, this wine. Even we end up talking more about the wine than the Lord Jesus did when he instituted the Lord's Supper about this wine. As soon as he passes the cup and speaks of his blood being poured forth in that cup is, is, is showing that in verse 21 it says, But behold, the hand of him that betrays me is with me on the table. The Lord Jesus can't separate from his mind the, the great blessedness of the Lord's Supper with the reality that it means that I will be betrayed by one of you who is right here at this table. This shows how his heart is thinking about the reality of his suffering, the reality of his sorrow. In, in, in the very next verse, he says, But behold, uh, uh, and truly, verse 22, the Son of Man goes as it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. See, his heart is thinking of the judgment that Judas will receive. But not just that. Everyone else in that table is not very um, compassionate toward Christ. We're going to see this next time. If you go to verse 24, we find out that they're arguing right connected to the Lord's Supper Who's going to be greater? And then, of course, Peter is, is full of, of pride, thinking he will never leave the Lord Jesus. And in verse 31, Jesus will have to tell Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And if we look in other places, um, it is in Matthew that we read the Lord Jesus just a little bit after this where he goes to Gethsemane where he says, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. 
And it will be in Luke that we will see the Lord Jesus in Gethsemane. And that's where it says that he will be um, sweating with great drops of blood falling down to the ground. It's in Luke that it says that the suffering of Christ, his agony at Gethsemane was so great that there was an angel who appeared from heaven to strengthen him. And so this is the Lord Jesus, his mind, his desire. It is full of love, full of expectation, full of anticipation, but yet full of sorrow all together. And even as we join together soon to partake, these are some questions that we could ask. Have you desired to partake of the Lord's Supper? Even despite the barrage of, of feelings and and emotions and thoughts that may be in your mind? Are you seeking to have Christ first and foremost in, in realizing he knows what all of that is and yet he desired to partake because he knew what it would mean? Do you come to the Lord's Supper full of love for the Lord Jesus? And I pray that having, having looked at his heart a little bit, it may, it may help you have a greater love and appreciation. And even as you're tasting the wine and drinking the wine and, and eating the bread, think of this reality that Jesus, as a human, had all these feelings, and yet he desired to partake. He desired to go to the cross for his own and do you come with great agony? Even the agony element can be part of our experience because the agonies of Christ were because of my sins, not his. And so we come to the Lord's Supper with an element of agony as well because we are remembering that he had to die because of my sins. And this is where we too experience this reality, which I agree, it is, it, is, it is impossible, humanly speaking, to be full of joy and yet full of sorrow. How do we do this? It is so much easier to have one of these or the other at given times. But the Lord's Supper literally calls you to have both. And as you, as you are in your prayers pleading before the Lord that you have the sorrow for sin, but that you have the gratitude for forgiveness. You, you are trying to achieve what you are supposed to achieve at the Lord's table. I've, I've said it before. I believe around the table, the church experiences um, what, what you, we never experience in any other moment in our lives. This is the moment where the greatest joy and gladness and gratitude and love for the Lord Jesus should happen, which is full of feelings of, that are positive, but where we are full of sorrow and sadness and contrition and repentance for our sins. And, and don't try to say, well, I, don't, I, I like to focus on one or the other. No, we are supposed to try to meld them both together. And, and this is why if, if, you, if you look at someone and you're full of sorrow, maybe with tears, but you see someone smiling, be thankful for them because you should smile as well. And if you see someone with tears, be thankful for them and, and, and ask for tears as well. Because we need both. And, and of course, we can't have tears and smiles at the same time. So, so we will be expressing those at different ways and at different moments. And this is where we respect each other and what we're able to, to manifest and to experience. But we, we don't see as foreign eat one or the other. If someone leaves a table with a smile or, or, or arrives with tears, they are both welcome at the table. Because the Lord Jesus said, can you imagine the moment Jesus says, with desire I have desired, perhaps he said this with a smile. But the moment he's giving the wine and he mentions the betrayer, maybe his eyes were teary eyes. And isn't this a reality of the Lord's table? He looks at his apostles and he begins to wash their feet. He does that with joy 
because he's serving them. But it's possible that he washed some of those feet with a lot of tears because he understood their sins. I envision that in his washing Judas' feet, perhaps there was much sorrow because when he looked at Jerusalem, he wept because of their destruction. This is the moment, beloved, where both of those feelings are supposed to coexist. This is why we need moments of silence, so that we pray, so that we're considering our own lives before the Lord and who He is and what He has done. And as we move into the Lord's Supper, we will look at our second point, the design of the Lord's Supper, which is looking at the bread and looking at the wine, which is what we typically do at every Lord's Supper and see what the bread is designed to do and what the wine is designed to do and the Lord's Supper in, in, as a whole. So let us then come before the Lord in prayer and then we'll sing Psalter 47, um, 5 through 7. Let us pray. Our gracious and glorious God, we thank Thee for having given us Thy Son. We thank Thee, Lord Jesus, that despite all of these anxieties in Thy heart, all of these sorrows where You even felt that Thou would die, so sorrowful even unto death, Lord, we thank Thee that thy heart was also a heart full of love and expectation, full of yearning to die for us. And we pray, Lord, that thou would prepare our hearts as we partake of the bread and of the wine, that we would be full of expectation, that we would be full of love to thee, and that we would be full of sorrow for our own sins and confess them, I'm humbly and sincerely before thee. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing then together Psalter 47, stanzas 5 through 7.